in France. And so, yeah, uh, my internet at my parents is a bit weird, so that might slow down things. So I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, I know Daniela. It's uh, Daniela told me. All right, so I think we can uh, we can get started, right? Um, let's see. Do yeah. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the first ESA session on norms, beliefs, and behavior change. Um, I'm extremely excited to have an uh, amazing colleague to agree to present the research, Simon, Silvia, Peter, and Roberto, as well as Christina, Gary, Daniela, Ares, and Nora, who, is going, who are going to discuss the presented papers. Um, we have 15 minutes of presentation, some Q&A, um, and then five minutes of uh, discussion time. So let me jump right into my talk, I'm going to kick off things uh, with a new project um, in which I'm examining experimentally the impact of political polarization on social preferences. So to set the stage, um, there is a host of literature that links political polarization uh, to, um, to some negative externalities such as racial inequality, uh, factional conflict and partisan animosity. And it's important to study these questions because they pose a credible threat to democratic values. Um, they affect the way people interact with each other, altruism, trust, and so on within and across political factions. Um, so at the bottom, you can see the Pew Center um, has issued um, um, a study over the past decades, there's been a rising polarization um, in the US. Now, there are other examples that are very timely um, in which in the context of which polarization occurs in the US. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the example of mask wearing, which is highly correlated with political affiliation in the US. And at the bottom, you see this very problematic finding by YouGov um, showing that the extent to which uh, the uh, Americans are proving of Biden being um, legitimately elected is a function of their own ideological sort of preferences. Now, there are a couple of contributions that I'm trying to make in this paper and, you know, for the sake of the time that the limited time that we have, I'm going to try to give you a little overview, but we'll not be able to sort of dive into all of the details. Um, so, on, you know, the big picture is that I'm trying to examine multiple layers through which political polarization can arise. Um, and I will study this in the context of behavioral belief and norm-based mechanisms. Um, and in the last step, I'm going to test whether nudging can help to sort of alleviate and reduce uh, the negative impacts of polarization. Um, I will do that across multiple settings, uh, strategic and non-strategic, uh, that allow me to capture um, multiple uh, environments um, and social sort of preference across altruism and cooperation and as well as social norms um, using both political and minimal identities. There are a few research questions that I'm trying to tackle, um, one of which is sort of the behavioral side. Um, and I'm trying to answer how does polarization affect actual behavior, uh, prone antisocial decision making, cooperation and so on. Um, but also does this behavior take shape in form of in-group love, out-group hate, or both simultaneously. So I'm going to try to disentangle those. Um, but then also, can we use simple behavioral nudges and behavioral interventions to sort of reduce that negative impact um, of polarization? The second layer is perceptional. Uh, the experiment that I'm going to, to show you, the host of experiments, also allow me to look at the perceptional side of polarization. Uh, in particular, uh, does how does polarization affect the interpersonal closeness uh, among people, but also the perception of social norms that sort of allow me to answer why we observe those differences in behavior, right? I will not be able to get to the norms in this talk. And of course, the paper contains more detail in that. Um, there are multiple settings, uh, four behavioral settings that I'm going to, um, to show you briefly today. Um, and um, and, and I'm going to give you the details as I sort of progress um, in the slides, but just so that you know what to expect, there will be a non-strategic setting in which I'm going to use the take or give dictator game variant as introduced by List and Bartsley in their papers. Uh, I've been using this quite frequently in my work and uh, coincidentally, Zimon, who is going to present next is going to also show you a variant of this take or give dictator game setting. There will be a strategic setting, which is the ABC of cooperation variant of the public goods game, um, which Zeman and his colleagues sort of um, introduced to the literature or helped sort of to, to disseminate. Um, there will be a social setting in which I'm looking at norms um, using the Kupka Weber method. Um, and then lastly, there will be sort of the choice architecture setting in which I'm using the default nudge. 
Now, there are two identity frames in a way. I'm going to focus on hate and love for Donald Trump. Uh, in the paper, I have robustness checks using Joe Biden, and, and I, will, I will briefly mention them towards the end. Um, and I will map this against minimal identity frames in which I'm using the standard Klee Kandinsky um, sort of setting. Um, I will, uh, and so in using both settings, mapping them against each other allows me to say whether the polarization that I see is um, in-group love or out-group hate or both simultaneously. So in addition to just showing polarization, I would like to answer also what kind of polarization do we observe in those settings. Um, and so all treatment variations that you see above are completely between design. The data collection ran in the summer through sort of winter of 2020 and is pre-registered talk about the first design, which is the first experiment, the non-strategic take-or-give dictator game, take-or-give dictator game. Um, and you will see the side-by-side -side the way the Trump prime treatments work versus the, the minimal group paradigm. And, and there's only one difference, really, and everything else is completely the same. Um, there are two stages, the preference elicitation stage and, and the actual behavior stage. The behavior stage was not announced uh, prior to finishing stage one, right? So they sort of were led into the next stage as they finished stage one. Stage one starts with participants seeing the exact same picture as you can see here, thumbs up, and participants are asked to rate on the liquor scale how they feel about Trump from extreme love to extreme hate, um, and, and also write a couple sentences that explain why they feel that way. It allows me to sort of filter out bots later and all of these things in order to ensure um, and after that, I'm using, um, I'm matching them randomly with a participant. I'm telling them now they will be randomly matched with somebody uh, who either hates Trump or loves Trump or for whom they don't know the Trump preference. Um, and I elicit this iOS inclusion of others in a self scale, which is this typical psychological measure of closeness, which Zeman and his colleagues uh, validated um, a few years ago in, the, in sort of economic settings. Um, and the way it works is um, they simply choose the circle or the pair of circles that represent how close they feel towards that partner. After they finish the stage, they play the game with the same participant and really they just play with one participant, one variant of the list uh, take or give game, which is essentially they start with $10, the recipient starts with five and they can decide to take up to five uh, or do nothing or give up to five of their own money to the other participant, right? So this is the extension of dictator game. In addition to doing nothing or giving something, they can reduce the recipient's payoff by taking. Um, obviously giving $2.5 will establish an equal split between the dictator and the recipient. And so in contrast to this, the minimal group paradigm works exactly the same way. They start with the Trump prime as well, but now there's this new second stage in which I showed them paintings, Klee Kandinsky paintings, and they just tell me which paintings they prefer. And then I randomly match them with somebody who either likes Cleo Kandinsky paintings or for whom they don't know the painting preference. In the minimal group paradigm, they never know anything, never know anything about the partner's Trump opinion. But I need this initial Trump elicitation in order to analyze the data in the same way, but also to keep the Trump prime constant across these experiments so that none of the results are driven by just eliciting any Trump preference, making people like angry angry and aroused and then whatnot, right? So they all start the same way, but then I also ask for the paintings and then they simply play the exact same game, but now they only know what the other person's uh, painting preference is and nothing about Trump. Um, so let me show you the results. The results will always be shown in this way, which is I'm going to show you uh, in color code um, how people behave towards participants who had a contrary opinion about Trump. This will be in red uh, and how they play towards participants who had an aligned opinion about Trump, which is in green in the paper, break down the data based on their own preference for Trump and so on and so on. I don't have time to do this today. Um, at the top, you see the Trump prime results at the bottom, the minimal group prime results. And here on the left, you will see the iOS scale closeness. And here on the right, you will see the actual dictator game behavior. So the first observation is that participants feel essentially almost twice as close to others who have the same opinion about Trump um, as compared to those who have a contrary opinion about Trump. And I also observe this 
uh, this differentiation, this in-group, out-group differentiation in terms of behavior, they give about 15% of their own money to, uh, to the participant. 50% would establish an equal split, so they, they don't reach the equal split. And they take about 20% of the endowment of the recipient uh, in the out-group sort of condition. In a minimal group prime condition, I pick up absolutely no differences. And actually, across all variations of this experiment, uh, in all experiments, the minimal group prime never yields any significant differences, which is nice for me because obviously the real comparison for me is sort of the difference and difference comparison. The difference in how they behave in a Trump prime compared to the difference in the minimal group prime. Now I said, I, in addition to showing this, I want to answer, is it an in-group law of out-group hate or both? The way I do that, I'm, I will be looking at the height of the bars and the way participants play towards the Trump, uh, sort of the, the out-group in the Trump condition, the height of the bars is exactly the same as they play towards each other in the minimal group prime condition. So what I'm picking up in the closeness, uh, I will call in-group love, and exactly the opposite um, is happening in, in the behavior. They behave towards the people who have the same opinion about Trump the same way they behave towards people who share or don't share the same painting preferences, but there's a stark negative reaction behavior in the Trump prime condition, okay? So out-group hate and behavior in-group love in in, in perceptions. Now, these are the results, but of course, I would like to say a little bit more about the mechanisms. So that's why I need the strategic setting in which I'm examining these additional layers um, of, of um, polarization, looking at attitudes, actual cooperativeness, and beliefs about cooperativeness of others. Uh, this is experiment two. Um, you can see the structure of the game is exactly the same in a way, except for the actual public goods game. They start with the prime, I, I listed the iOS scale, and now I'm playing the game. I'm borrowing essentially from Zemon's uh, and colleagues' nature human behavior paper, and they keep being matched with one other participant. And now they go through three stages um, in which I'm going to elicit different behaviors that are part of the ABC public goods approach. Uh, the first task is an attitudes uh, towards corporation elicitation. Um, essentially, I'm, I'm presenting them with a conditional response mechanism strategy method, and I ask them, what would you do if your partner does one, you know, contributes one or two or three dollars? And so at the end, you, having that schedule allows me to say, uh, is the observed, uh, is, the, is the participant a conditional cooperator, a free rider, unconditional cooperator, and so on. The second task is about the beliefs. So I'm incentivizing, eliciting incentivized beliefs, asking participants what they think their partner will actually do in this experiment. And the third task is the actual effective one-shot public goods game cooperation. In the end, I'm randomly choosing one of these tasks and paying uh, for the decisions in that task. It's all incentive compatible. And again, I'm doing exactly the same thing for the minimal group prime with the exception that I'm now asking for the painting preferences. And now they play the whole game with somebody for whom they only know the painting preference or for whom the painting preference is not disclosed. Um, now, why do I do this? What, are the, what kind of insights can I generate using these, this environment? Well, I mean, for one, I can distinguish between the belief and preference channel. And that's, that's important because um, for example, the reason why the factions don't cooperate with each other could be because they believe that they will be screwed over by the opposing party. So this would be a belief channel. Alternatively, or on top of that, it could be a preference channel. They could just be completely unwilling to cooperate with somebody from the opposing aisle. So that would be a preference channel. And so having the ABC approach allows me to disentangle this. So let me show you the results. Um, again, the results are being presented in exactly the same way, but rather than dictate a game behavior, for now you can see the beliefs about the other's contributions and the own one-shot public goods game contribution. Now, the first observation is that, again, I'm picking up huge, huge uh, uh, polarization effects in terms of perception, again, but also in terms of what they believe the partner will do, which is a function of their uh, sort of Trump um, preference, but also their own contribution. And again, I see absolutely nothing for the minimal group prime. Now, again, the question is which of these things is in-group love and which is out-group hate? Um, I'm again looking just at the height of these bars. Um, the way, so the closest again is in-group love. They feel much closer towards the in-group and the height of the out-group bar is the same, but everything else is an example of out-group hate. 
the height of the green bars is the same as the height of all of these bars, but they actively believe that the outgroup will screw them over and they actively contribute less towards the outgroup. Now, in case you haven't seen my messages, 14 minutes have passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so I have two more slides, really. Um, one is now this is the types of the players. So these are the attitudes, which now allow me to sort of look at conditional cooperators, free riders, and so on. And what uh, what you should take away from this is that there's absolutely no difference, neither in the Trump prime nor in the minimal group prime. And now this is the result, essentially. Participants are absolutely willing to cooperate with each other. But what's really driving the differentiation in the contributions is, is the beliefs, are the beliefs that that people are afraid that the opposing party will screw them over. It's not an attitudinal thing. It's more of a belief channel. Now, here's the conclusion slide. Um, the question, of course, then is, is the polarization specific to Trump? I told you no. Uh, I, uh, I didn't tell you that, but I'm telling you now. I, uh, I did the same experiments with Joe Biden, and I see almost the identical results. Um, and then, of course, the question, the last question, this is going to be my last slide, uh, which is sometimes we cannot correct these wrong beliefs. Sometimes it's not feasible. Sometimes it's not enough. So the last question of the paper is, can we use nudging in order to limit and reduce the polarization? And I can tell you that nudging the default nudges. So the reason I use default nudges is because in the literature, defaults are perceived to be the sort of the strongest, simplest interventions with the strongest effect sizes. And here are the results for the default nudge for the dictator game. And what you can see is that the polarization remains, the gap is the same, there's a level effect, I see overall um, higher contributions, the default is you give half of your money to achieve equal split, that's the default. Um, and so it doesn't close the gap. Um, and we don't see uh, any reduction in the gap, we just see a level effect, but the gap remains. I observed the exact same thing for the public goods game. In the public goods game, the default was being completely cooperative with somebody else, regardless of their political affiliation, all right? And so that's the takeaway from this. Um, I'm one minute over time. I appreciate your, uh, you know, uh, any questions that you might have. Thanks so much. All right. Any, any questions? I guess since I'm, I'm uh, moderating this this presentation. I worry oh, a little panel. bit about order effects. Yeah. Say, so, Gary. Yeah. Because you've got uh, you've got something followed by something benign, and that just might be muting it. And I just wonder if you reverse the order, what happens? When you say the order, you mean the way I elicit the Trump preference and then the behavior? Yeah, if you do the uh, the, min the, the minimal thing first and then do, you do the paintings first and then do Trump. Do you get different I, yeah. results? Yeah, so I don't have that. I think it's a good question. Yeah. I My main research question is really about Trump. So I was afraid if I start No, 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 to... no I understand that. Yeah. But it's just that yeah. you may be changing their view when you give, you just may be erasing the slate when you do that. And yeah. I just wonder. <laughs> Yeah. And I think your intuition is correct. I think that's partially responsible for why I see absolutely nothing in a minimal group uh, yeah. results. Yeah. But again, I'm mostly concerned with the difference and difference between those. Um, so, but yeah, it's a good point. And yeah. If I were the referee, think. I'd make you run that. Yeah. I will, I will, uh, I will, I will keep that in mind for you. <laughs> any, any more questions? Um, Eugen, do you see systematic differences between Trump lovers and Trump haters, or can you pull this? Yeah, paper? so I, I didn't present those results here. They are in the papers. They are remarkably close, actually, right? So none of the differences that you just saw are driven by one group, but not the other, right? So once I break it down, sometimes the gap is a little bit smaller, but I see the same in-group, out-group, hate, love, differentiation across those things. Um, so I would say remarkably close, actually, right? Levels might be different, but the actual differences are, are remarkably, remarkably close. So we have one more minute if anybody has. OK, there's one question from Andrew. Uh, can the difference be due to media source rather than party affiliation? Do you have any information about their media source? Uh, Right, so in a way, I'm I'm approximating uh, their opinion about Trump, uh, and that could stand for a host of different things. I'm also asking them what are they voted. I asked them also the strength of the opinion about Trump, 
I didn't ask about the media. I, I would assume a lot of that would be correlated. I think Dave Rant's work, and, and I mean, Eris will be the person who knows probably the most about those papers, uh, shows that there's, a, there's sort of a disparity disparity between the news sources that they sort of uh, go to. Um, I don't look at that. Um, so I can't really speak to this in this paper. All right, so um, let me um, then allow my discussant Christina to take over. I'm gonna share, stop sharing. Great, start it. Okay, so thank you very much for the paper. I enjoyed reading it. Um, very timely, also very new experiments. So it was great to see. Um, overall, I think it's an interesting contribution. You have nine experiments with 6,000 observations. That's quite a lot, I think, for these types of experiments. Uh, what I also really liked is the structure of the paper that you first identify behaviors, then you investigate how beliefs and preferences affect these behaviors, you check for robustness, and then in the last phase, you think about how policy instruments, in this case nudging, can affect the observed behavior. So I think just as a start, I think it's a very great example of an experimental paper structure bringing these different parts together. And I also think that the question whether this in-group love or out-group hate um, is, is more important or is stronger or is that the same thing of, the, um, of one coin um, is also very relevant for making yeah, policy decisions and where do we actually want to target with information or with different types of um, of policies. So I really enjoyed that. So I have a couple of things that one might want to think about. And one thing is going a bit in the direction of what Gary already said about the question, what can we also conclude when we compare preferences for Trump with preferences, for example, Clint and Kandinsky, so moving them into different groups. It makes a lot of sense to take this minimal identity setting, I think. I was a bit surprised to see nothing, but it might actually just be that this Trump thing overwrites um, the idea. Um, so, so that might also be something to just test, like would these people be affected by that? So can you actually just replicate what has been shown before? Because it has been shown to work in other settings. Um, but of course, here you don't see anything. And then you didn't have it as strongly in the presentation, but in the paper, then you write, for example, that the emotional state that is evoked by this political polarization runs these, or that's where, where you get the results from. And well, I guess that's true in the direct comparison. Can we really say this is political or can we say this is emotional, right? So you could say, are these like vegans and meat lovers or are these Taylor Swift fans or are these economic students versus um, art students, right? With Taylor Swift, you might have a very emotional reaction. Some people hate her, some people love her. That might not be very political, but very strong emotion. While maybe economic students versus art students, you might have different beliefs about contribution in the games, which is something you find later in the public good game that this matters. You might have Star Trek versus Star Wars. I don't know if they love or hate each other, but it might just be two different groups and people who closely identify with this. So I think in order to say that it's really a political or, or that's what drives it, um, I think it would be interesting to see how can we also find this in other areas or maybe tone it down and say, okay, there, there is something that Trump creates which is different to something that's just created by some arbitrary two groups. Um, and I think this is also especially relevant looking at the public good game results where you find that it is very much about what people believe the other person will do and maybe not so much the preference of how much I I like the other person how much I feel that I'm close to them. Um, so yeah, so that might be something to uh, to consider. Then I think also the question of what is love. So preferences versus behavior. You call this closeness to another person. You call it in-group love, while you call the behavior out-group hate. Uh, now also the way you had it on the slide, but. To me, when I was looking at it, I saw perceived closeness was more of a priming check. Did this work rather than an actual outcome of a in-group love? So I think I would more say is it in-group, out-group love or hate more from the behavioral part, which if I read the original paper where you got this from correctly, then they also talk about behavior rather than um, in intentions. But yeah, maybe it's just something to clarify a bit more. And then I think um, maybe a bit more broader question would be, should we expect this closeness to actually linearly map onto behavior? So should we expecting this channel of how close do I feel to somebody and to a particular behavior? For example, there's these, a lot of these information papers such as Holland and Roth who look at information provision and they show that this shifts individuals' beliefs. 
in this case about the extent of racial discrimination, but it has actually no effect on the support for pro-Black policies. So there's actually not that direct mapping. And I think that's also something to discuss a bit more. And then um, you, this, this one you didn't have in the, in the uh, presentation on this result, uh, but the question is, is this change in pro-social behavior driven by those who hate Trump or those um, who love Trump? And while I was reading the paper, I was wondering a bit, do people in your sample hate Trump the same way as they love Trump. So is that balance? And if we do look at the um, at the appendix, then we see that we have a large, much larger share of people who claim that they extremely hate him rather than extremely love, which you talk about in the paper saying that the MTurk sample is less likely of them. But I guess what we don't know is are there people who are, would say, I absolutely extremely hate him so that you have a much higher mass on that side. And then maybe also the X axis extending to the, to the left even a bit more further. And then lastly, I think if I'm uh, still have uh, one minute, I thought that, as, as you know, I do a lot of nudging. So I was very interested in this part to think about should nudging work in this case? And uh, I find that in your conclusion, you more say that, oh, it doesn't seem to work that well. I actually thought it worked pretty well because what you do in the paper is that you take those individuals who say they're indifferent in regards to Trump, you throw them out of the sample so that you have those ones who say they hate and love him. But I think if we talk about nudging, we usually target people who are pretty close to indifferent, right? So people who don't care that much either way, and then we can nudge them over to one or the other side. So I think already we're giving nudging a bit of a hard start that we're taking these more extreme individuals. And then actually the default still has an effect from the negative from minus 20 to about zero, as we saw. So taking away the hateful behavior Yes, there's still a gap between the groups, but I don't think it's that surprising that there's a ceiling effect at zero for um, yeah, not, not reacting to that. So if I don't feel they're the same as me, so I, I don't think it should be a linear effect necessarily going into the positive when we think about this case. So I think my, um, my reading of this would be much more that it's actually quite a positive outcome for nudging. Great, thank you so much. So uh, th that was amazing. Um, and let's give uh, Zimon now the chance to present his papers and uh, you and I can chat sort of uh, after, after this. Thanks so much. All right, Zimon, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, very interesting session where um, I'm, we present this paper that's also joined with Eugen, Christina Bicchieri from UPenn as well, and Daniele Innocenzo from Aarhus. And um, then we talk about the role of social proximity in, and the erosion of uh, norm compliance. So, um, Obviously, in this session, I probably don't have to explain that it's important to study social norms. And um, economists have the last few years uh, paid quite some attention more than before on the importance of social norms for guiding human behavior beyond just simple cost benefit calculus that also often guides people's behavior and which were probably prominently studied uh, before social norms featured. But now uh, we also look at social norms as a guide for economic and social behavior. So the experiments that have been done, and uh, there's too much literature that I want to review here, they are in the paper, uh, is that compliance um, with norms is often fragile and it's also asymmetric, meaning violations are often more consequential in terms of norm compliance than compliance with the norms and future norm compliance. So meaning you know, bad apples, uh, bad apples can spoil the barrel. So non-compliance um, decreases over time, in particular when there is no punishment and things like that. So, uh, <clears throat> however, what we also see from this evidence is that most, in, most evidence is from anonymous interactions. So people have no idea who the other uh, people are, or maybe just some broad idea, okay, a fellow student or a fellow m or whatever, or a fellow American of some sort or whatever, yeah. So, but they are, this is a bit of an omission uh, or something that we think is worth studying and produces maybe hopefully, as you will see later, some interesting results. 
social norms are often important in the non-anonymous non settings. And why? Because these settings, um, first of all, they are just prevalent. And uh, second, they allow for signals of social similarity or dissimilarity with other people. And the question is, has that some behavioral and psychological significance? So the, it possibly has because people can assess when they have some signals of social similarity to the extent to which they share common traits, common characteristics, and whatever identity. And I will use the, or we will we use in this paper, we use all of these things, we lump together under the general term of social proximity. Yeah, so that there is some social closeness uh, in, in terms of uh, observable characteristics or uh, traits. And we will have a very simple manipulation of this, which as you will see is fairly powerful already. So the question that we study here is, can signals of social proximity moderate the influence of bad examples? So in anonymous settings, as I said before, we expect that compliance uh, is driven by bad, bad examples, selfish behavior of people violating norms. Is social proximity moderating that? So why might that be? Yeah, because uh, similarities can trigger processes of group identification, which uh, social psychologists and also economists uh, have shown are important in guiding people's behavior. And um, people in general respond to expectations of what's appropriate group behavior. And um, if there is a group identity, if there's group you know, uh, behavior, this type of expectation might also be triggered. And therefore, people then may respond to good and bad examples. And um, without proximity, without this, without this shared uh, group identification, uh, this shared similarity, violations might be more salient because uh, you know, also the appropriate behavior dimension shifts more into the background. So that's the, that's the reason, uh, the, the, the motivation. Uh, uh, let me now introduce the, the design. Um, I start with an overview. So we do two types of experiments. So we do a little bit more, but uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I focus on the most important experiments. So behavior experiments is 842 students in the lab in UPenn. Uh, with a dynamic environment, I will explain in a moment, and the possibility of behavior contagion. So the, the game that we use is a take or give donation game, which is a dictator game basically with a charity where you can either give to the charity or take from the charity. So players are endowed with 100 EQ, experimental currency units that translate into dollars. And people can give to the charity, which means they can use this money to, to give it to donate it to the charity, but they can also take it from the charity, meaning it's, this money is provisionally allocated to the charity and they can take and make uh, some amount and they can just abstain and doing any, nothing. So X equals zero. So that's the take or give game. We repeat this over 20 rounds. And um, we also vary the knowledge of uh, what other people do what the peers do and the social proximity to peers. I will explain all of this in the next slide. And then the second type of experiment we ran about which I will be very brief is a normal elicitation experiment that we ran, uh, we ran also at UPenn and uh, with uh, 464 MTurkers. So, okay, that's the overview. So the, the, we, we ran these two types of experiments with take, this take or give donation game repeatedly and a normal elicitation experiment. So here is the behavioral experiment in, uh, sorry, I would first say something about the existence of a norm from these normal elicitation experiments very briefly. So we established that in this setting, there is indeed, as you're probably not surprised to hear, the, uh, a norm of giving to the charity and not taking from it. So we established this using techniques uh, developed by Christina Bicchieri and Krupp Kaveber, where we measure with an independent group of people uh, 
their uh, personal normative beliefs, their empirical expectations and their normative expectations. And uh, what we find is that the majority believes that most people will and should give to charity. And uh, we can probably fairly uh, is be fairly certain that there is a, uh, an existence of a social norm, which means you should give and not take. So let me talk about the behavioral experiments now. So here are the design details. So we have uh, four parts to this. The first part is part one is the pre-experiment, which is our manipulation or measurement of social proximity. This is a very simple question. There's one question, yeah. And the question is, in what year did the Phillies uh, win the last World Series? Yeah, which uh, only probably sports uh, fanatics know. And it's about uh, 27 or so percent of people in the uh, did actually know the answer. And then we, we will use the social proximity by grouping people who knew this question and those who didn't. So the second part is, uh, uh, at the, uh, is a one shot, a one period uh, individual decision uh, where we have played this uh, give or take game just once. And people can take one of three actions. They can take money away from the charity and anybody who does this, you know, we will call a norm violator, uh, which is consistent with our observation that there is a norm of not taking. So you're a norm violator if you do take. Or you can do nothing, we call you an abstainer. So you neither take nor give to the charity. Or you can actually donate, give money to the charity at your own expense. Then you're a norm follower because we have established that there is a norm of giving. But that's with play once. So and after that, uh, people are introduced to the second part, a third part, which is uh, 19 periods of individual decisions within a group. So, so we randomly uh, allocate the participants to groups of size two or four, and then they just continue in the same way, the same game here, tick, tick, give, take, dictate the game, a, a donation game. And the payoffs are independent between group members and periods. So there is then no monetary pay of spillovers between players. So we have three treatments here yeah, between subjects. The baseline is no observation where the play is take or give, dictate the game just 19 times in a row without any feedback, not knowing what other people did. So they, the group members do not observe the others take or give decisions. In treatment one, which we call observation, people see what other group members did in every period. So, and uh, in, 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 uh, in treatment two, which we call observation social proximity, observation SP, social proximity, and people observe, but also know uh, whether they are paired with somebody who also answered the Philly question correct, correctly or not. So, and then we have a post-experimental questionnaire where we just give some demographics. So that's the design. Simon, you have four experiment minutes. Experiment where we measure social proximity, a one-shot game, a take, a give or take game, and then these three treatments played over 19 periods with no observation, observation or observation, and social proximity. So what are the hypotheses that we have here? So uh, in observation, people will react more strongly to examples of norm violation that is taking then examples of non-compliance giving. Yeah, again, on the background of our result that this is the norm. Uh, and over time, this will lead to a decline of compliance uh, with the norm of giving compared to no observation. So in no observation, we will expect fairly flat behavior because there is no feedback. And, um, but with observation, we will expect uh, some decline of um, non-compliance, non meaning more taking than giving. The second hypothesis is related to social proximity. Uh, social proximity will reduce the asymmetric effects of peer information. Um, subjects in observation SP, social proximity, will respond to examples of both non-compliance and violations, and thereby reducing the erosion of non-compliance. 
So let me start with the part two. So this is the first round, the one shot, the one shot, one off, uh, take or give donation gain. So what do people do? So, so this is the average change in the charity box that you can see here uh, uh, for the three between subjects treatments, no observation, observation, and observation and social proximity. So obviously there is, there is no feedback, they know nothing uh, about other people. So on average, this is what people take and it's not significantly differently across the three, different across the three treatments here. So slightly less than half, about more than a bit more than 40% in all treatments. Again, similarly across the three treatments are initial takers in this one shot game, meaning they, they not violate the norm. Uh, a, a little less than 20% uh, are initial givers and uh, there are some abstainers, which is the rest. So, so this, this, the, the, the norm compliers, the norm followers are in the minority here. The abstainers and, um, and the initial takers are fairly similarly distributed. So now- Simon, you have two minutes until you're 15 minutes yeah, over. Okay, so um, um, this is the main result. Um, of norm erosion here. So this is measured relative to, to this one shot experiment that I just explained. So what I said before in, 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 in this is the, this black line here is no observation, meaning you don't see what other people did. And as I suggested, there is just a little bit of decay at the beginning and then it's fairly flat. This observation also in, in consistent with the first hypothesis that compliance declines. And the social proximity, it's, it's fairly similar to an observation, a little bit lower towards the end. So these are periods. And um, we can see this also in the averages. So this on average, without, uh, without the observation, the average is about minus 4.9 relative to the per first period, overall periods, minus 21.9 in observation and the minus 7.5 in uh, observation SP. So that's a, uh, that's a, a clear result that the proximity mitigates the behavior as hypothesized. So there is some heterogeneity here, which I very briefly uh, show here by splitting up whether you are initial norm follower in the, in the, in the first, period, first experiment, an abstainer or a norm violator. And uh, we also see whether there is no observation, very on the no observation, the observation, the observation SP treatment. So, and, um, so when I start with the norm followers here, what you can see the no observation between uh, the initial behavior, initial decision, and what you do in the first 10 periods and the last 10 periods is fairly similar. In observation, this shifts dramatically here. Yeah, people are in initial norm followers in the beginning, but then over time this collapses. And in observation as speed is moves again closer to, to to, to the average here, to, 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 to what you do initially. Abstainers are at a, a bit uh, directionally similar, but uh, slightly less uh, uh, pronounced here. And, uh, and uh, for norm violators, there is no such thing. So they just violate and they keep on violating. So there is some heterogeneity in here. And the people who change are the initial norm followers, not the norm violators. So norm, you're a norm violator and people who violate norms from the beginning, they do so consistently towards the experiment, towards the end. So last slide, we did also some follow-up experiment to, to study the drivers of norm compliance. So from previous literature, we expect a direct mechanism, which is belief updating after observing others' behavior, which is biased towards selfishness without social proximity. So when you see somebody uh, doing something, you know, then that it is uh, violating a norm, which we have seen initially happening a lot. People just update their beliefs, their empirical expectations, and that drives uh, uh, the decline. When they see um, social proximity, some people are also willing to contribute, which keeps beliefs higher up. And with, not, with no observation, beliefs don't change, so people comply. There's also an indirect mechanism, which is to revise what's considered socially appropriate. Um, and uh, this is what we demonstrated in a follow-up experiment that the erosion of norm compliance is associated with a downward shift in normative expectations. 
but not in personal normative beliefs. So um, this uh, suggests together that uh, social proximity uh, uh, works both through up sustained uh, higher beliefs as sustained higher normative expectations. Thank you very much. Great, Simon, thank you. So we have 90 seconds for a couple of open questions. Anybody from the group or Q&A? Well, I got my own talk, so I mean, I, I don't feel like yeah. I should be making comments now. <laughs> Anybody want to use the minute? All very clear, very good. <laughs> that is one hypothesis. <laughs> we want to hear Gary talk about it. So. Oh, right. That's even, <laughs> even, even more absurd, but okay. Sure, I will. Well, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Oh, there's one. Uh, Zimon, do you see that? Why do beliefs matter in a take or give game? Maybe a quick answer to that. Yeah, they just matter because pe pe people in general, when uh, with norm compliance, you, 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 co you people comply with norms if they think other people comply. That's why it matters. It's not strategic. They're not strategic beliefs. This is um, people want to do it if other people do it. That's the reason why beliefs matter. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Gary, yeah. take it away. Uh, I'll try and share my screen. All right, you guys see that? Yes, yes. Good. Yeah, you see I went really high tech here. Um, all right, the main theme of the paper is that you have this asymmetry. Um, you do get observing people uh, declines things over time. Why is that? That's a central question. But when you give this uh, little piece of information about the Phillies, you see that it almost goes back to what it would have been without any observation. So one of the real questions here is why do we have this asymmetry? I've argued for, God, I guess it's decades now that um, it's because of a difference in, in the way expectations work that you kind of expect people to do things that are nice. And, and so when they do, you don't react that much, but when they do something that uh, goes very much against your expectations and is negative, you react a lot. In the paper, they argue that the, what they're seeing the asymmetry is due to the fact that um, taking money enriches you and giving money makes you poorer. So that might make a difference. I agree that might make a difference, but I think it's a deeper issue. I think that if you have a test where both giving and taking have the same financial cost, you're still gonna see this difference. In fact, we've seen it elsewhere. Um, this type of thing, you see it, you see lots of negative reciprocity. You see very little positive reciprocity. Uh, the declining contributions in the VCM. This goes back at least as far as Teo Offerman's paper and I think it was a 99 paper, uh, hurting hurts more than helping help. So this is a well-known phenomenon. Um, it's not completely clear what is driving it. And that to me is one of the interesting things in the paper. Um, so here they found this thing about the Phillies. I wonder what else might've worked. Uh, well, I mentioned, I already gave them detailed comments on their paper. So I'm going fast here, but they've gotten all the de detailed comments. There are some papers that are relevant. Well, there are some of my papers that are relevant. Um, the decline is, is serious, but it's not really huge. So they might want to look at that. Um, one of the big issues though, that I have here is that where I say I'm quite confused a little bit, but oh yeah, there's something, there's nothing in the paper. Uh, there, there really isn't much discussion about how the norms were elicited. I didn't find it anyway, maybe it's there. But there's a, a basic issue that I have about what, is, what does it mean to be giving money? Um, in my view, if you do anything except for take all 100, you've given money to charity. And that's not the way it's viewed in the paper. They call people abstainers. 
Now, if I was given the opportunity to take a hundred from a charity or, or give an extra hundred and I didn't take, I would say I'm complying with the social norm. The question is whether the social norm is to give anything additional on top of the hundred. And that's not so clear to me, actually. So, um, oh, the paper needs a lot more summary statistics. Uh, there's some other stuff that you won't really care much about. Um, some of the follow-up experiment I thought was interesting and it should have been in the text. And they talk about this, about the expectations. This is what I mentioned already. Um, so my guess is that most of this is driven by people who are in the in-group knowing the Phillies, uh, who won the Phillies. Uh, it's not such a rare thing. If you live in a city and you're at all a sports fan, you tend to know when you're, you're the team in the city won the last, their last World Series. So it's not so arcane. It would have been nice if they calibrated 50-50, but that's life. Um, so I would have liked to have seen a little more analysis about that. Um, overall, I mean, it's a very interesting paper. Um, I, I think there's a lot to this idea that there are different forms of observation. And when you can invoke some form of social identity, you will be able to reverse a decline. Um, I think it's a nice result. I do have some comments like I've made and some issues, but, uh, I think that's all I have to say. And I'm happy for anybody, uh, the, the people who wrote the paper to quiz me on my comments too. Great, Gary, that was perfect. As uh, Dimon, you have like 30 seconds that you can use if you like to respond to any of those comments. No, thank you. These are, these are, these are very good comments. Uh, we probably, you know, sh um, I don't remember whether we cite the Theo's paper, but I do remember his paper. Yeah. So if we, if we haven't cited it. it uh, yeah, give him a cite, and, he's a good guy. Yeah, he's, <laughs> um, and then I will do it. And obviously we, we do cite some of your papers, maybe not all. Well, you too many good ones, Gary. But, um, I, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, Both good ones. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the thing is, you know, obviously I have worked on the declining contributions in the VCM. Of course. And so far the idea we have come up with is only punishment and some sort of such things and maybe, but um, <laughs> that, um, um, so social proximity um, uh, is something that's prevalent in in in, in social world. So it, uh, sure. it it its consequences should be studied. I mean, we we have taken a very small thing. So uh, obviously, you can imagine much stronger settings. Where yeah, no, I like it. I like be. it. I mean, I made critical comments, but I like the idea. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, Sylvia, uh, we're excited to have you. All right. I think, um, Gary, you need to launch. OK, great. Yeah, perfect. All right. OK, so I'm very excited to, to be here in this session um, and present a joint work with Marta Sara Garcia. And in this paper, we are interested in the question of whether individuals anticipate uh, some of the conditions that enable them to distort their beliefs in the moral domain. Um, so if I can move on. OK, so belief distortion is widespread. There is a lot of work suggesting in psychology and economics suggesting that people um, or like uh, um, that people want to distort their beliefs, that the desire to hold desirable belief about themselves is pervasive. People want to believe that they are smart, uh, correct, ethical, and so on and so forth. And in order to protect those beliefs, they tend to engage in a variety of strategies. Uh, large, uh, a large uh, literature has shown that, for example, individuals avoid information that might force them to update their beliefs, or and this will be more like the focus of this paper, when confronted with this information, they still find in, uh, ways to engage in um, ex post signal distortion. So uh, find ways to um, dismiss uh, underweight or like even forget or flexibly interpret um, uh, informative signals. So we know that a lot of work in economics has documented this phenomenon, uh, and yet, there are cognitive limits to people's ability to distort their beliefs. In other words, people cannot always distort their beliefs whenever they want. But belief distortion is enabled or constrained by features of the environment um, and contextual cues. And so one open question in this literature that, um, uh, that inspired this paper is whether 
individuals can anticipate the conditions under which they can more easily distort their beliefs in the face of undesired information? And if so, do they actually pursue um, uh, these like um, uh, uh, these domains in which like they can um, uh, do they leverage these opportunities to distort their beliefs or do they constrain? And um, in this paper, we attempt to provide some empirical evidence to this question in a series of online experiments. And we focus um, for, this, uh, for this work in the moral domain. Why the moral domain? Because it's a domain in which um, previous research has shown that people do distort their beliefs to benefit, to enjoy private incentives. So whenever in the moral domain, whenever people face moral dilemmas, they tend to receive usually uh, at least two pieces of information. Information about what benefits themselves and information about what benefits other people. When the information about what benefits other people cannot be avoided, um, distorting beliefs require what we call cognitive flex flexibility, the cognitive ability to engage in reality denial and dismiss or flexibly interpret informative things. Um, if people anticipate the conditions that provide this cognitive flexibility, then they might choose to pursue them or to constrain belief distortion committing to more like moral behavior. Prior work has shown that whenever information about what benefits other people cannot be avoided, the order at which individuals receive information about what benefits themselves and what benefits other people can really um, limit or enable belief distortion. So work starting from Babcock et al, or including my own work with Ulrich Nizzi, Mar Marco Saragarcia, and Rolf Albert Dyson, and other work has shown that whenever individuals receive information about what benefits them first, before they receive information about what benefits other people, they have more cognitive flexibility to distort beliefs and behave self-servingly as compared to a case in which the information about what, benefit, uh, what benefits other people comes first. In this case, work has documented that belief distortion and self-serving behavior are more constrained. So building on this um, finding, what, uh, in this paper we will ask, do individuals anticipate this effect? Do they anticipate that uh, the order of information can enable or constrain belief distortion? And of course, like when we look at anticipation, like it's a very hard question. So in order to explore it, we will use the real preferences approach. We will ask if given the choice, do individuals seek out the cognitive flexibility needed to alter their beliefs or would they rather choose to constrain it as a form of commitment to accurate beliefs and moral behavior? And then conditional on, on preference, we will look at beliefs and choices. And we will ask the question, does actively seeking flexibility preclude individuals from subsequently being successful at distorting their beliefs. And in the philosophy, in the philosophy literature, there is uh, philosophy literature. There is actually a big debate on exactly this question on whether, like, people can intend to distort their beliefs and being successful at doing so. With the camp of philosophers actually arguing that this is uh, really not possible because the mere intent of wanting to distort beliefs might preclude individuals from them being able to do so. And so our experiment will also allow us to provide some empirical evidence to this. We ran a series of online experiments inspired by the domain of fiduciaries. So like think about financial advisors, legal professionals who are tasked to make decisions that are in the best interest of a third party, but may face private incentives uh, to behave otherwise. In this domain, we will vary the order at which people like receive information about what benefits themselves and other people, and we will ask advisors to choose their preferred order of information. So the experiments uh, look like this. So we invite participants to the experiment, assign them to the role of advisors, ask them to evaluate two uh, products and make a recommendation to an uninformed client who doesn't know anything about the products, the incentive or anything, just receive the recommendations, like in a typical standard receiver game. Um, the products are uh, earned that give the client some chance of earning $2. So product A gives the client a, a three in five chance of earning $2. Whereas product B has unknown quality. Um, with 50 chance, it has low quality and with 50% chance, it has high quality. If the quality is low, then it only gives the client a two in five chances of earning $2. So it's worse than product A. If the quality is high, it's a four in five chances of earning $2. So it's better than product A. 
So the, this is how the products were displayed to the, uh, to, the exp uh, to the advisors in our experiment. And before making the recommendation, the, um, the advisor receives two additional pieces of information. Information, uh, uh, so first, the, no, not first, like they receive two pieces of information, a signal about, of, uh, about the quality of product B, which was one ball randomly drawn from product B. So either zero or $2, right? Which could help the advisor to uh, update their beliefs about the actual quality of product B. And then the other piece of information was information about the advisor's incentive. So the, the advisor knew that they could receive a commission for recommending either product A or product B, and they would learn like uh, which product recommendation will uh, give them the connection. And uh, this, um, the product that, that gave the commission was actually randomized in our experiment. Okay, so first of all, like we replicate prior work showing that cognitive flexibility um, uh, varies, um, so that um, the varying the order of information provides cognitive flexibility, varying the scope for self-serving behavior. So take an advisor who learns that first learns that um, he is incentivized to recommend product B, and then learns that the, the ball from product B is red. Based on prior work, we argued that this um, information order provides more cognitive flexibility to, see, uh, to dismiss the signal because when people process the signal, they already know their incentive, as opposed to a case in which the advisor first learns about the, the, the signal of quality, learns that the ball from product B is red, updates his beliefs about the quality of product B, and then learns about his incentive to recommend product B. So we, we argue that this information order provides less cognitive flexibility to dismiss the signal. Um, so we ran an experiment on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Participants were uh, paid a fixed fee of, um, of 50 cents and knew that they could receive an additional commission depending on the recommendation. The commission was 15 cents. And the treatment variation was simply the order of information. Advisors either learned before uh, the uh, uh, first uh, the information about the incentive or first they uh, learn about the signal of quality. Then when they learn the signal, the signal could either be good news, so aligned with the incentives, or bad news, in conflict with the incentives. In this graph, I will show you the fraction of incentivized product recommendation for cases in which the signal was in conflict with the incentive. And as in line with prior work, we, uh, we find that whenever people uh, learned about um, the incentives first, they were more likely uh, to make uh, the incentivized product recommendation as compared to the case in which they first assessed the signal of quality. This is not the case when the signal is aligned with the incentive. Okay, so this first experiment replicates prior work and shows that learning about the incentive first provides individual with more cognitive flexibility to behave self-servingly. Now let's move to the main experiment. So we look at preferences. If given the choice, do advisors choose to see the information about the incentive first or do they prefer to assess quality first? In the choice experiment, everything looks identical to the, the experiment I just presented, but advisor could choose whether to see the, uh, the incentive first or to assess uh, quality first. We have three variations of this experiment. One um, in which uh, the, the choice of uh, information order was free. So choosing to see the incentive first was free and we ran it on me uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. The second variation was run with uh, uh, professionals from legal and financial industries. And again, they, they made a simple choice between seeing the incentive first and um, seeing quality first. So the choice again was free. And then we have a third version in which the choice of seeing the incentive first was costly. Participants could give up a third of their commission, so like five cents, uh, in order to actually re uh, receive informa information, uh, the information about the incentive first. This graph, shows the preferences. And what we see is that indeed preferences are quite heterogeneous from 58% to 42% of advisors, um, um, like where the advisors who actually prefer to see the incentive first. So we see that for professional, it's like actually significantly smaller, uh, but the main takeaway from this figure is that 42% of participants in our sample were willing to incur a cost to receive information about their own incentive first. So okay, you have four so people, minutes to the 15 minutes. Sure. People do pursue, um, uh, do are willing to pay to receive information about the incentive first. Next, we can ask, does this active choice to pursue flexibility preclude advisors from successfully distorting their beliefs? So um, like in line with what uh, philosopher or some a camp of philosophers 
argue saying that the intent of wanting to distort their beliefs might actually preclude people from being able to do so or does it work do people who actually like um, choose to receive information about their incentives first uh, are they still able to distort their beliefs after making this active choice so one important feature of our design is that advisor choices were only implemented with 75 percent chance and this was known to the advisors when they made the, ch the choice this is the feature of the design allows us to observe con conditional on preferences, actually the counterfactual. So for example, for advisors who prefer to see the incentive first, we can see their behavior if they were actually assigned to get the incentive first, so they got their flexibility, or they were actually, or if they were assigned to see quality first. And, by, and the same for people who prefer to assess quality first. So again, I will plot the, the, the fraction of incentivized product recommendations. This is just for the treatment in which the incentive, the choice was like free. See, the incentive first was free. What we see is that the fraction of incentivized product recommendation is the higher among advisors who preferred to see the incentive first and actually got to see their incentive first. And so conditional on preferences, if advisor were not assigned to see their incentive first, we see that they were less likely to make the incentivized product recommendation, suggesting that indeed, if people chose flex, uh, to pursue flexibility, they were actually be able to use it in order to actually uh, behave so servingly. We also see that the um, people who prefer to assess quality first and actually got it were the least likely to make the incentivized product recommendation. We see the same ranking among um, in the among the professionals as well as uh, whenever the incentive um, uh, learning about the incentive first was costly. And so, uh, and uh, even if you look at uh, regression, we see that um, uh, conditional on preferences being assigned to see the incentive first increase the likelihood of making the incentivized recommendation. So it does enable people to be able to serve it. But so far, I talked about beliefs, right? And so is this really evidence that people um, distorted their beliefs? We asked in our experiment, what was the likelihood that the quality of product was low? And what we see in our um, analysis is that if advisors were um, assigned their, for advisors who were assigned their preferences, prefer, uh, like if advisors would prefer to see the incentive first, were less likely to update in a Bayesian, Bayesian direction upon learning the signal, and then um, um, their posteriors were, was way closer to the prior. So they have also updated less. So we do find evidence that these people actually distorted their belief. So, so far, what did I show you? Like we find that a substantial fraction of advisors, so 42% fixed out cognitive flexibility, wanted to learn about their incentives first, even if costly. And we find that it works, right? Actively pursuing flexibility does not preclude belief distortion. But at the beginning of the talk, I started like uh, talking about anticipation. So is this really evidence that people were anticipating that learning about the incentive first will provide them with the flexibility to distort their beliefs? So of course, it's an odd question to answer. We have like in, um, three pieces of evidence that points in this direction. First, we have open-ended responses. And when we look at open-ended responses of the participants, we find that people anticipate that seeing the quality signal first reduces belief distortion, limits bias. Second, we ran a separate experiment with forecasters, asking them to predict the effect of information order of recommendations. So like if people anticipate, they will be able to predict it. And indeed, the evidence finds, we find that in, in, um, lay individuals are able to predict the effect of information order on recommendation. And finally, this is the last uh, piece, um, the models of self-deception like, um, suggests that indeed if people want to see the information about the incentive first is that because they want to engage um, uh, sorry enjoy the monetary gain right from um, from engaging in self-serving advice and so what we ask is that uh, do advisors choose to see the incentive first because of these incentives right or is it just like maybe because they're just curious about the information um, and so in the last experiment, we, we ran a new experiment in which we fixed the cost of seeing the incentive first at five cents and buried the size of the commission, so the monetary gains for distorting beliefs. So we have like um, uh, the low incentive treatment, the commission is only one cent. The intermediate incentive treatment, the commission is 15 cents, which is the replication of the choice experiment. And then we have a high incentive, high commission uh, of 30 cents. And so if individuals are really driven by the incentives, they will only want to uh, to choose to see the information about the incentive first when they can actually enjoy the benefits. But if the, these choices are driven by curiosity, they would also do it when the incentives are really low. 
And um, this gap shows like the preferences and what we see is that in line with our hypothesis, uh, when the incentive is very low, the fraction of people who want to uh, pursue this information, like receive information about the incentive first is significantly lower than the intermediate incentive. Right, the intermediate incentive, we see that 41% of the participants want to receive information about the incentive first, which is remarkably close to what we got in the other experiment, which was 42%. And then when the incentive is higher, however, we don't see that this increases a lot. So it seems to be quite concave. And so, but uh, overall, this, this experiment that does suggest that people are not just motivated by curiosity, but they want to receive information about their incentive first and only when they can actually benefit from it. So taken together, I showed you that individuals are willing to pay to pursue cognitive flexibility, that pursuing cognitive flexibility does not preclude belief distortion, and taken together the evidence on uh, forecasters, open-ended responses, and these last experiments suggest some sophistications about the cognitive constraints to belief distortion. Thank you so much. Great, Zulia, <clears throat> thanks so much. That was great. Uh, we have time for one quick question before Daniela takes over. Anybody, any questions? Um, Sylvia, I have a question. Um, so um, you also show that people who wanted to assess quality first, but then they couldn't do it. There's also an effect. And I wanted to ask, why do you think this is? Is this like a moral absolution? I wanted to do this, but now I cannot. And then it's fine. Or what do you think? Right. So, I mean, we see that when the or information order is exogenously assigned without making any choice, right? Any, yeah, choice, we, we do see this effect, right? We see that whenever people learn about the incentives first, they just put more weight on this information, right? And then they are more likely to make uh, the incentivized recommendation. And even if people are like moral and they want to commit to the moral behavior, we do see evidence that, well, if they don't get it, um, that's it, right? So they, then they, they behave more uh, self-servingly. And so we didn't necessarily predict this and we were, it's, it's interesting that we, we, we find it in the, in the data, but, uh, yeah, it's like maybe people committed to an environment that constrains the serving behavior, but if they don't get to make decisions in that environment, that that's done. They can't, um, yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. So Daniela, uh, take it away. You're muted though, if you want to unmute first. So thank you, Sylvia, for the for the nice talk. Uh, and uh, I, I really enjoyed reading the paper and I thought uh, it's quite an impressive paper. So there's lots to like. One thing I liked uh, uh, quite a lot is sort of the way that, uh, um, so this paper tackles, I think a question that uh, is far reaching in its importance beyond the immediate results of, of the paper, because I think it speaks directly to this growing consensus in the literature about the importance of self signaling and social signaling in uh, human decision making. And you know, this literature is vast, but surprisingly, I think we know little about how uh, these phenomena are, eff are affected when uh, individuals can take an active role in exposing themselves to this uh, signaling or deception opportunities. And I think studying this question is important because it sort of can reveal some insights, uh, deeper insights about the functioning of these models. You know, can we really assume that uh, an individual who actively plans to self-deceive is successful in its deception or in the same way as someone who sort of uh, does not anticipate uh, uh, this, uh, this type of, uh, of, uh, of phenomenon? And, uh, and also, I think it speaks about the strength of these effects, because most of the literature has focused on this exogenous sort of deception opportunities, and perhaps it has overestimated the, 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 the scale of this phenomenon. But I think your result that sort of this sort of, uh, this phenomenon is robust to this type of anticipation effects, I think it's, it, it was very surprising to me, and I think it's quite interesting, and it suggests that uh, we are looking at phenomena that probably run deeper even than what we potentially thought initially. So there's a lots of other things that I liked. <clears throat> you know, it's an extremely rich paper, lots of treatments, different samples, large scale, high powered. Uh, I, I also like the lot the fact that you know the design is fairly minimal. Essentially, your treatments differ in the order of information subjects receive across two computer screens in a handful of seconds, and yet you sort of obtain this sort of uh, reliable and substantial uh, treatment effect, which I think again speaks to the 
fact that you're looking at something which is quite substantial from a behavioral point of view. And the paper, you know, was very well written, so it was easy job for me to uh, make this discussion. So I sent you already, Sylvia, the comments uh, detailed uh, beforehand. I just want to focus on a couple of things that I thought deserve perhaps a little bit more the discussion. So, you know, your, your experiment does a lot to, uh, to uh, disentangle uh, the possible different explanations behind uh, your results. And, you know, you line up quite a lot of evidence that is consistent with your main explanation. That is, you know, we observe belief distortion that is driven by motivated reasoning. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, somehow I missed a little bit of a smoking gun treatment that conclusively rules out any possible alternative explanation. And uh, you mentioned some of these explanations in the, in the paper, you know, simple order effects. I thought cognitive load could be another one, you know, maybe Bayesian updating is not as easy to do when you have to hold in your mind the information about what is best for, your, for yourself in, in terms of what you have to choose next. I also thought that you know, your treatment resembled a little bit this literature about the differences in fairness judgments between stakeholders and spectators. And you know, this literature argues that there's a fundamental difference in the way these people form judgments when they are put either behind the veil of ignorance or not. Uh, so even if they don't engage in motivated reasoning. So you know, I think your, your treatments can eliminate some of this explanation, but I think not all of them, and perhaps in a combination of these explanations could sort of rival what you, what you proposed. So I thought that maybe there's some value in thinking about some additional treatments that you could, you could run where you uh, could take out uh, completely the motive, for example, for holding motivated beliefs. So in your experiment, the motive for belief distortion lies in the fact that advisors uh, need to act, know that they will act on their belief. They will have to act on their belief by giving advice to another player. So you could, for example, design a treatment where you do not tell advisors that they need to give advice until after they've reported their beliefs about the quality of the project. And then you could compare these beliefs with your original treatment beliefs. And if you only observe distortion in your original treatment and not in this new treatment, uh, then I think you can conclusively say that uh, what you observe in terms of belief distortion is driven by motivated reasoning. And the last thing I want to say, so I mentioned the clients, uh, sort of this other player, I think it would be good if your paper could say a little bit more about what clients knew about the structure of information provided to advisors and what advisors knew about what clients knew. And that's because, you know, if advisors care about the clients, uh, then they may have reasons to engage in sort of a misreporting of advice in a strategic way. So for example, if I suspect that the client will not follow my advice, when I'm in a condition where I see my payoff information first, then I might send untruthful advice in this treatment, but not in the other one. And then you might get sort of this treatment effects that could contribute to, to part of what you're seeing. Uh, so it would be good if you could say something about that. But you know, overall, I, I really like the paper. So thank you for giving me a chance to discuss it and, uh, um, and uh, for, the, for listening to, to my talk. Perfect. Daniela, thanks so much. <clears throat> we are out of time, so let's move to Peter's presentation. All right, uh, let me try and share my screen. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'll be speaking about a paper called Anticipatory Anxiety and Wishful Thinking uh, that I'm working on with Jan Engelmann, Maëlle Le Breton, Joel van der Wehle, and Liang Chang. So our point of departure is that wishful thinking or self-deception often seems to be driven by a desire to feel less anxious. So we, might, we may deny health risks because we are anxious about contracting a certain disease. Our fear of death may cause us to believe in afterlife, even in the absence of, say, scientific evidence for its existence. And there's some work that suggests that it's fear of economic decline or economic anxiety that really makes people prone to buying into simplistic populist narratives. So what we want to do in this paper is use a simple experiment to ask whether the desire to feel less anxious causes people to self-deceive into believing that things are going to be all right. And if we find such wishful thinking, we want to ask a couple of questions that are important in economic models of motivated beliefs of wishful thinking, namely whether wishful thinking is facilitated by ambiguity of evidence, or conversely, whether more precise information makes it harder for us to self-deceive, to engage in wishful thinking. 
also whether wishful thinking is responsive to incentives for accuracy. Do people trade off psychological benefits of having biased belief with the material costs of biased beliefs? And finally, is wishful thinking heterogeneous across people? So let me give you a very sparse view of the literature. There's a couple of models in economics by Benabou and Tirol and by Prunemeyer and Parker that study individuals that trade off the psychological benefits of being optimistic but uh, and the material costs that stem from uh, making bad decisions because of biased beliefs. And obviously there's a long tradition, or maybe it's not obvious, but there's a long tradition in psychology that wrestles also with the question of wishful thinking quite saliently, terror management theory contains some of these ideas. Um, the, but the experiments that are closest to what we are gonna do are experiments that study whether the savoring of future monetary rewards causes people to distort their beliefs. So these experiments in a sense ask the question, does the estimation of lottery success depend on my ownership of that lottery? Um, and this literature very much has mixed results. There's a, there's a beautiful paradigm in Miovic, Prelik and Prelik, uh, in an, an experiment in which they find, yes, there is something that looks like wishful thinking. Miras finds um, optimism. Um, Kai Barron in his paper finds a, a null result and there's mixed results in Alexander Kurt's paper. Um, there's quite a few differences uh, between our paper and these papers. The most significant one that we are after anxiety and we're looking at you know, a negative consumption event. Um, and this brings me really to the main challenge of our experiment, which is how do we induce anxiety in a way that we control? Um, and what we do is we use electric shocks. So shocks are a proven method of inducing anxiety. Um, they've been shown to uh, increase heart rate, uh, skin conductance, physiological markers of, of, anxi of anxiety. And we also like them because they're a precisely timed negative consumption event. So let me tell you about the experimental tasks that our subjects face. They try to guess the tilt of a pattern uh, called a Gabor patch, like the one I'm showing you here. And that pattern is either left tilted or right tilted. You are looking at a left tilted pattern. Um, but this pattern obviously is not shown to them at great length like I'm doing now, but flashed on the screen for a few milliseconds. Um, so it will look something like this. So probably I didn't, uh, I wasn't quite as fast as, as what our experimental subjects would experience. And then you basically have to tell us whether this pattern is right or left tilted and you will get paid for identifying the tilt of the pattern correctly. So how do we put these two things together? Um, well, first, as I said, subjects have to um, guess or tell us what the tilt of the pattern is. But before they see the pattern, we tell them that, for example, a left tilt is associated with them getting an electric shock after a certain amount of time has passed. And our main treatment is then going to be whether them receiving a shock is associated with the correct answer or with the incorrect answer. And what we call wishful thinking is identified as follows. If I tell you before you see a pattern that you're going to get a shock for a left tilted pattern, the pattern turns out to be actually left tilted, and you do worse in identifying this pattern than on a pattern that's right tilted, then you're engaging in wishful thinking. So you're choosing not to see the state of the world that is scary to you. Wishful thinking is identified as the accuracy on non-aligned patterns where shock and correct answer are not aligned minus your accuracy on aligned patterns where you know where the true answer um, implies an electric shock for you. This is our main treatment, varying the alignment of the electric shock with the correct answer. We have 
to other treatments. One varies the difficulty of the pattern recognition between a hard, a medium, and an easy difficulty level. And now hypothesis is that ambiguity, like the ambiguity that arises from greater difficulty, will increase wishful thinking. Again, conversely, that more precise information makes wishful thinking harder. In a third treatment, we vary incentives between one euro and 20 euros for identifying patterns correctly. And our hypothesis is that greater incentives to identify patterns correctly reduces wishful thinking. Okay, so we implement all of these treatments within subjects. So we have a lot of trials that subjects go through. And um, the advantage of having within subject treatments, which I think in this paradigm works well and is not so controversial, is that we can identify types. We can call people wishful thinkers. Uh, motivated beliefs in all experiments that I'm aware of are usually identified via a treatment effect. So by having the treatment effect within subjects and having a lot of trials, we can uh, talk about types. Subjects uh, go through individual sessions that we conducted in Amsterdam and we had 60 subjects. So if I gather this correctly, that's um, one hundredth of the subjects that Eugen had in this uh, experiment earlier. But we are nonetheless well powered. First note, we have within subject treatments, so you can kind of double the number and then also note that these subjects really understood what they were doing. They were in, in individual sessions and we calibrated the difficulty so that we are identifying a potential treat a treatment effect off of every subject really. Um, and then finally, this experiment was pre-registered. And with that, I will move to the results. So what I'm showing you here is a histogram of the wishful thinking uh, exhibited by all of our subjects. And we see that a majority of subjects is exhibiting some positive amount of wishful thinking. So they are better at getting the patterns correct if the pattern they're seeing but might not correctly interpret is not associated with an electric shock, if the wrong answer is associated with an electric shock. On average, wishful thinking is 4%. So they are four, sorry, four percentage points more likely to get a pattern correctly that's not associated with an electric shock. And we see there's some people, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Some people exhibit a lot of wishful thinking. And there's even some folks that uh, seem to exhibit the opposite. Um, and on average, we have significant wishful thinking. All right, so our next question was, does the ambiguity of the pattern increase wishful thinking? So we had different difficulty level, levels, easy, medium, and hard, and difficulty was varied by varying the tilt of the pattern. It's uh, substantially harder to correctly identify um, a tilt that's closer to the, um, to the y-axis, for example. And these difficulty levels were calibrated so that easy meant you're going to get 60% of patterns right, and hard meant that you get, sorry, hard meant you get 60% of patterns right, and easy meant you get 80% of patterns right. And these levels are recalibrated after each part so that limits the influence of fatigue and learning and we can use later trials to still um, identify our effects. So here's what happens to wishful thinking. You have four minutes to 15 minutes. Okay, great. Here's what happens to wishful thinking as we move from easy to hard. Um, it increases for the hardest of patterns. Wishful thinking is the highest when the information is the most ambiguous, when the signal is the least precise. Okay. So this is our results on difficulty. How about incentives? Does the size of the accuracy bonus reduce wishful thinking? I told you we varied incentive levels between one and 20 euros, uh, varied between blocks and paid one trial within each treatment. And Here's what we find for incentives. And here we basically find no effect. What we would have expected and what 
basically all but one economic model of motivated beliefs would predict is that higher incentives lead to less belief distortion, to less wishful thinking. And that already brings me to my summary slide. We see that on average subjects engage in wishful thinking. This tells us, you know, if it happens in this small world of our laboratory, that anticipatory utility is likely to matter. Uh, it's a very hard thing to identify how big a role does belief-based utility play uh, versus consumption utility. So th these motivated beliefs experiments are an indirect way to say, look, belief-based utility is likely to be very important. Um, and we, in a sense, find that optimi while optimism leads to suboptimal decisions that have often been the focus of, of uh, the literature, they may well be the result of an optimizing response uh, when anxiety is important and have the benefit of reducing anxiety. We also find that clearer evidence reduces wishful thinking, which implies that avoiding precise evidence, avoiding precise information, um, information avoidance might be um, a phenomenon that, that might, might be engaged in in order to facilitate wishful thinking, which, which I think ties in nicely with what Sylvia talked about before. Um, so the, we, we kind of show that there would be a motive for information avoidance coming from uh, a self-deception motive. And finally, we see that accuracy incentives in our setting do not reduce wishful thinking. This contradicts economic models of motivated beliefs, but obviously it may be, as our other results, domain specific. In particular, we think that incentives might matter more in the more deliberative, slower processes of motivated reasoning, where we really get in the pro and con arguments and not in this sort of instantaneous, I perceive a stimulus and now I'm gonna interpret what I saw um, kind of, um, Paradigm. Okay, and that's uh, that's all I have. Perfect, Peter. Thanks so much. We have uh, a few minutes for open Q and A. Um, Peter, you had this variation that there was um, many wishful thinkers, but there was also a minority of people who was uh, rather pessimistic. And I wanted to ask, what happens uh, when the ambiguity goes up? Do they become even more pessimistic, or is it like everybody becomes uh, a wishful thinker? I see. I think that's uh, like, like the short answer is we haven't looked at this, but I think it's a very interesting question because it might help us also understand whether it's, it's just noise that we're seeing or whether it's perhaps, I mean, you know, there might be people who want to hold pessimistic beliefs. There might be something like bracing yourself for the shock. There might be, I mean, you might like electric shocks and be a wishful thinker and it uh, manifests as, as pessimism in our paradigm. Um, but whether it's noise or a motive might be, might be actually identified by this diff and diff you mentioned. I like that. We, we'll look at that. Thank you. Peter, we have questions in a QA. and a I'm happy to relay that to you if you don't see it. Um, okay. I'm trying to open it. I'll just, I'll just read it out. Okay. Excellent. So Dan Stone uh, asks whether you think the, the confidence intervals for uh, your results on high and low incentives might be too large to rule out a null effect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so we've I, I can tell you maybe in what I've shown you, yes, but we, we've replicated this. So it's, it's very robust. I've also shown you the most uh, like ridiculously conservative way to show this, which is pooling all the observations for each subject and then uh, and then running statistics on these 60 values. If you do it sort of the right way that, that involves a bit more uh, metrics, uh, it looks better. So, so we get significance here. So this is significantly different, but it's very close. But the real effect through replications and through sort of more legitimate but less, uh, <laughs> less transparent models also indicates that this is a strong effect. Great. I have a couple of comments. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, first, I don't think you can conclude that accuracy incentives do not reduce wishful thinking. Your power is way too small. It looks like it's going the right direction, but you only have 60 observations. Um, the second thing is I do have some concern about, this may be completely necessary, but having a subject in the lab by him or herself with lots of observation, 
I'm not going to make the list scrutiny argument, but I just wonder if that affects anything. So those are my two points. Okay, so so I think they're both legitimate, and they will be taken care of in the current revision. And uh, and and uh, no, no, like like we we can actually see that. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have to increase the power to talk about uh, to talk about the incentives, given that it's potentially a small effect. To do that, we'll we have to collect a lot more data, which we're busy doing, um, and we trying to we, we've come up with a paradigm that doesn't rely on electric shocks to take it out of this individual setting that then that would be takes nice. care of uh, takes care of uh, this observational issue or anything that might be specific to this current paradigm. Yeah. Great. So there are a couple more questions, Peter, that you can check out later. So then let's give uh, Eris a chance to uh, provide his comments. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I enjoyed the paper very much. Um, I think it's a super clever paradigm for documenting wishful thinking. Uh, it's a really striking example of biased beliefs. You're giving somebody a motive to be accurate, and they are. it seems from some of the results, they're even somewhat aware of the fact that they they are being uh, sort of unrealistic about their beliefs, but they can't really do anything about it. And, and it's a really striking example for me. Um, the main thing I'd like to focus on is um, the interpretation of the results. The primary interpretation given in the paper is uh, I think perhaps one that most of us find quite natural, which is that uh, anticipating a shock is uncomfortable. And so we avoid this discomfort um, and to avoid it, we bias our beliefs. Um, I think my interpretation is that that's probably actually not what's going on. Um, our mind is not really designed to not make us uncomfortable. Um, rather, discomfort is designed to make us avoid things that would make us unsafe uh, or hungry or wet or cold and things like that. Um, and so if you thought that people were designed to avoid being uncomfortable, they'd find themselves going outside into the cold without a jacket on or touching hot stoves and things like that. So I think um, my, my uh, guess is that that interpretation as appealing as it is, is probably not, that's not the guess that I have at least. Um, I think there's probably two other interpretations which um, uh, are possibly going on here. Um, one I think is unlikely and one I think is probably the thing that's going on. Um, the first one that I think is actually unlikely is that people just suck at making judgments under duress and you're placing them under duress when you're making them uh, get shocked. And um, that uh, duress is uh, somewhat uh, asymmetric. So they, they're like slightly worse at making the decisions um, when, they're, when they realize they're about to be shocked than when they're not. And they like screw it up in the system or something like that. I think um, I don't, uh, that would suggest that you would find a difference between uh, a bigger impact um, uh, on uh, accuracy than on beliefs. And I don't think you really do. Uh, you still find the effect on beliefs. And I think there's probably other ways to rule this out. It just doesn't seem to me like a super likely uh, story, but I think, I think it might be consistent with your results. The other possibility is, and, and the one that I think is probably going on here and the one that uh, I think is interesting um, and in no way makes your study less interesting um, to the contrary, perhaps. Uh, and that's that uh, anticipatory, anticipatory anxiety is a way of dealing with basically two conflicting motivations that are present in the situation. Um, and these biased beliefs on the one hand, on the one hand, you're getting shocked and that's uncomfortable. And, uh, and so like you kind of want to avoid that. Uh, but on the other hand, you've committed to being in the study, you're getting paid at the end of the study. And so basically you're getting, tri you're tricking yourself into sticking around and, uh, and sort of gritting your teeth and, and making it to the end of the study through these shocks. And one way our body has to trick us, one, one tool that it uses all the time to trick us is to get us to believe things that are um, uh, unrealistic and to make us, you know, overconfident or over oh, Excuse me. Sorry. I did not hear. Uh, Should I just go ahead, Eris. I think it was Gary. He just asked. Just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my guess of what's going on is that it's this option that basically um, we we realize we we have this additional motivation in addition to to um, 
to avoiding a shock, which is to complete the study. And so we fool ourselves into doing that by, by making ourselves think that it's not as bad as it is. Um, and a, a nice way to test that is to eliminate the, the um, um, possibility or eliminate the, that incentive to stick it out. Um, and so you could do that by, for instance, paying subjects up front. That's one of the ways that, uh, that I uh, thought of. Um, another way is to allow subjects a small number of times that they could take off the probe that causes the shock, the wristband, maybe like three times out of their, their um, 10 trials or however, I forgot how many trials you had with them, um, but uh, allow them to take it off a few, a few times, which now suddenly gives them an incentive to correctly anticipate the shocks and they'll probably be more accurate in general, but they'll also probably be less biased. I'm not sure these are the best ways to do it, but I think it would be a cool additional treatment um, and it would help you to uh, distinguish these two possibilities, the one that, that you've motivated the paper with and the one that I, I think is uh, uh, also uh, a possibility. And uh, I'll stop there. Great, Aris, that was, that was amazing. Thanks so much. And then let's uh, move to the last presentation. Roberto, feel free to share your slides. Can you see my slides? All great. OK. All right, well, so uh, before I start, thanks again for organizing this uh, really nice session, putting everything together. So on behalf of all the presenters, I think we, we owe you thanks for, for um, doing this. Um, so this is papers uh, with uh, the co-authors that you see listed here. Um, and several of us have worked on, on related uh, topics on this in, in varying configurations. So this paper deals with something that has grown uh, in, in importance in, in economics and relate, and particularly in economics uh, um, recently, which is to what extent do people exhibit concern for external social impacts in, in their market behavior? So whether they're, um, when they're choosing where to work, when they're choosing what products to buy, um, to what extent do they care about the impacts that their choices have and particularly in market context. And so there's been the theoretical work and uh, a lot of experimental work as well, including um, work by Nora, of course, um, that looks at what factors influence these types of concerns and the extent to which these are, these are um, robust concerns. Um, so in, what we do in this paper is we study um, one of these potential factors and the thing we're interested in is studying something we call public discourse regarding kind of what people should do in market settings and what's the right behavior to do. So when we look around, we see a lot of examples of things that might fall under this label of, of public discourse. So you know, things like um, the World Economic Forum hosting you know, sessions and dialogues on kind of environmental concerns to um, uh, large organizations like PETA or Greenpeace to kind of smaller grounds up organizations like the one organized uh, uh, for Fridays for Future that aim to get people to um, uh, uh, think about their behavior and potentially change their behavior in market context with respect to these types of uh, impacts. Um, so while these things exist and we can look at them out there and, and perhaps correlationally see if they have some impacts on behaviors, of course, in the real world, things are often quite messy, uh, too messy to establish causality and rule out um, other potential omitted factors or things that change over time that may be kind of um, driving uh, behavioral change. Um, in addition, outside, um, you know, uh, in, in many natural situations, um, the effects of these types of public discourse or campaigns may actually be complicated by the fact that it's possible to have arguments on both sides, right? So for every instance where we can think of a possible campaign or arguments why we should curb some type of market behavior can produce, consume less of some type of product. There might also be arguments that are put forth aimed to convince people um, to, to do more of that behavior, to dismiss the concerns by others. And so I think in order to understand, you know, what types of impacts these types of, um, you know, public discourse um, uh, um, interventions or, or, or phenomena have, we need to try to understand them better. And so this is what we do. And um, part of what we do is basically just bringing to this particular type of context, um, a form of, of treatment or intervention that's been studied extensively in experimental literature, which is uh, the effects of communication. So there's many studies going back decades that show that when you let people communicate, they end up acting often in more pro-social ways that improve efficiency. What we're doing is certainly related to this, but I think it also is different in an important way, which is most of this earlier research, whether it's on public goods games or trust games, looks at situations where the parties communicating can make themselves mutually better off by reaching some type of agreement or some type of covenant to kind of engage in some behavior that they, they then um, uh, continue to pursue, right? So they're better off with communication than without. In this particular type of setting that we're gonna study, um, something that's particularly interesting that also applies to many of these real world situations is, 
you, you know, people discussing, maybe trying to convince each other to do things that are worse for themselves, right? So let's, let's use this technology that's more expensive to produce, or let's use these products that are more inconvenient that actually make us worse off with the goal of producing some benefit elsewhere. And that's gonna be a feature in our experiment as well. So what we do in this paper is we study in two experiments, the effect of, of a simple form of public discourse on social responsible market behavior. We use the, 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 the design that um, Bjorn Lanyao and I have in this earlier paper from five years ago, where we basically have a, a simple version of a product market where firms decide what types of products to offer and the prices at which to sell them. Um, exchanging a product produces a value for the consumer of 50 minus whatever price they pay, of course. Um, and where the key decision on the part of firms is there's two types of products, one that produces an externality on a randomly selected third party that doesn't do anything in the experiment other than potentially bare externalities, um, and what we call a fair product that doesn't produce an externality but costs more to produce. Right? The cost is small relative to the external impact, so it's, it's, it's kind of efficient in, a, in an aggregate welfare sense to, to, to produce this more costly product. Um, but of course, the benefits go to these third parties that are not party to the, to the market exchange. And so the way the market works is firms set their price and their, the type of product, and then consumers arrive in this posted offer market and see the types of products available and decide which one to buy, if, if any. Um, and what we do in this experiment is something very simple, which is we allow these simple laboratory societies to engage in a one-time eight-minute um, electronic chat period uh, in which they can discuss you know, the, the, the market, what's the right thing to do in the market, um, prior to engaging in 24 rounds of this market activity. And what we can do in the laboratories, we can vary both whether discourse is present or not, and also characteristics of the discourse that may give us some insights into why it's effective and when it can be effective outside the laboratory. And so this is basically our design where in a baseline treatment, people receive instructions about the market, they learn their roles, right? So then they find out whether they're a consumer, seller, or third party, and roles are fixed for the duration of the experiment, and then they participate in 24 rounds of the market activity. At the end, we elicit norms of market conduct using this Kripka and, and, and Weber method that other people have um, mentioned in, in today's uh, session. Um, so this is our baseline, and this is basically just a replication with new subjects, um, a new point in time of what we did in the Bartling Weber Yao paper. Our other treatments all include this one eight minute period during which we create a single kind of chat box where, where people can type messages that are seen by other market participants. They can't direct messages to specific people. They can just type in things that, um, that others, others will see. And what we vary is the timing and who can participate in the discourse. So we start with what we think is the most idealistic um, form of communication that if anything is likely to work, it, it, it's going to be something like this, where people engage in discourse behind a, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, where they um, uh, don't know their roles yet, right? They know that they may be a third party and the third parties are, are, are strongly harmed by these, these externality producing products. And where we, we assume that these, um, no, the, the arguments for efficiency and for avoiding the, 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 the product with externality will be particularly strong um, uh, and people will feel empathy for, for people placed in that position since they very well may end up in that, in that particular position. So we think this is the, the kind of idealistic form of, of discourse that is unlikely to occur outside the laboratory, but which we can create in the laboratory to see the, the degree to which it has an effect. In our other two um, treatments, we, ver we, we have the same type of discourse, except the one thing that varies is that now people know their role. So they find out first whether they're a consumer or a seller who benefit from the lower cost product or a third party who's harmed by it. Right? And then they engage in public discourse. And the one thing that varies between the no veil and the exclusive treatment is in the no veil treatment, all three types of participants can participate in the discourse. In the exclusive, we kick out the third parties. Right? So this is modeling something like a situation where at the World Economic Forum, um, you know, consumers and, and uh, people representing firms from, from high income countries are discussing their impacts on low income countries without a great deal of representation from people um, uh, uh, actually harmed by these externalities. Um, and so without going into too much detail, um, we generate some hypotheses about kind of what we think may happen in this particular um, uh, setting. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we think that the veil condition is gonna be the one that if anything works will work because it produces the sense of empathy and the fact that it could be you and that um, it struck the possibility of strong arguments for, for um, uh, um, not imposing the externality. Um, and then we think that these additional changes where first we remove the veil and then we remove the third parties from the discourse will lower these types of concerns, right? So the hypotheses that we're testing are whether or not when we go from um, uh, the baseline to, to veil, 
and then from veil to no veil and no veil to exclusive, whether we get these particular patterns of changes. We don't make any predictions about what should happen when we compare, for example, exclusive and the baseline, because we don't know if the, some of these effects, or we didn't know going into this, whether the, some of these effects would um, kind of uh, be the net positive or a net negative. The one other thing we do that I won't talk about um, here because of the, the, the short amount of time is um, uh, we vary, um, uh, we conduct the experiment in two populations, one in, in Zurich using university students, another one using university students in Shanghai, um, uh, where in our previous uh, studies, we found that there are differences in terms of the baseline levels of um, concern for social impact and in the, in the market share of these socially responsible um, products with it being higher in Zurich than in Shanghai. The reason we did this um, variation in this experiment as well is to see if there was any differential impact of discourse in these two different populations, which um, uh, um, we'll see didn't turn out to be that interesting. Um, so these are just some um, details that I won't spend a lot of time on. The main thing you might be interested in is just that we had eight markets for each treatment in each country, right? Where each market consists of these 16 people in these three different roles. Um, okay, so then um, let me then show you then what happened. So in our baseline, we basically replicated what we did in the earlier Bartling Weber Yao paper. So we found these stable um, market shares. I'm not going to show you the change over time because they're fairly stable. Um, uh, basically, roughly 50% market share of the fair product in Switzerland and um, slightly below 20% uh, in China. And so then what we're interested in is what happens when we introduce this idealistic form of communication where people engage in discourse behind the veil of ignorance, right? They know what the setup is. They know what the market activity will be. They don't know their role yet. And so what we see here is that in Switzerland, it goes way up, right? Um, and in China, it goes up substantially as well, right? In Switzerland, we're almost hitting the ceiling with close to 100%. And in, in, in many sessions, it's actually 100%. And only the fair product um, is, is uh, traded over the course of the experiment. All right, so now we see that this idealistic form of communication behind the veil of ignorance can in fact produce very high levels of, of socially responsible behavior. And remember, this is just a one-time communication at the beginning of the experiment, and then they go on to play 24 rounds, um, and it seems to persist and have you know, quite strong effects um, uh, throughout the experiment. The next thing we, we look at is what happens when we remove this veil, right? What happens when we basically now let people know what their role will be prior to engaging in discourse? And what we see is that this reduces it somewhat, roughly by the same um, amount, both in Switzerland and China. The decrease in Switzerland is statistically significant when we're using a very conservative test, using the session as the unit of observation. In China, it's not. And the reason for that, even though the changes are similar in magnitude, is that in the veil in Switzerland, there's almost no variance, right? These are all groups that are essentially at 100%. Um, and so anything below that in no veil ends up um, yielding a statistically significant difference. Um, so the change is consistent with what we hypothesized, but not at that great in magnitude. The last thing we can look at is what happens when we kick out the third parties? What happens when we kind of now only have a discourse taking place between the consumers and the, the sellers in this market? What we see is in Switzerland, in fact, if anything, it goes slightly back up in the opposite direction what we predicted. In China, it goes back down again, but the difference between no veil and exclusive in China is again, not statistically significant. Um, so this basically shows you these conservative tests using the, the, se the, the session, or, or no, not the session, but the market as the unit of observation, where we see that everything is different than the baseline, um, but the only one of these additional things that we predicted would lower social responsibility by taking out some important factor, like removing the veil of ignorance, is that in Switzerland, you get the significantly lower market share under no veil than veil. Although again, the difference is, is not huge and the level is still considerably higher than in the, than in the baseline. All right, so in terms of that, right, what we two find in this- to 15. Um, okay, I, uh, okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of um, what we find then in this first paper, uh, in this first experiment, we find that public discourse has a strong positive effect on market social responsibility. And perhaps, you know, most surprising, this is really strong across all of these treatments, right? Even treatments that we thought would kind of make the effects weaker, like, like the exclusive treatment where the third parties are kicked out from the discourse. In Switzerland, it still remains at 92% market share, which is you know, far higher than in the baseline. Um, the impacts in terms of the percentage point changes in behavior are similar both in Zurich and Shanghai, um, two populations that start from very different baseline levels. So we thought there might be some interesting interactions there, and we, you know, we don't seem to find that. Um, uh, in addition, we conducted another treatment where we, instead of, um, we did this after these first treatments, where instead of um, letting them engage in discourse, 
we allow them to engage in private reflection for the same amount of time, typing some message just to the experimenter about what they think the right behavior is to do. Um, we realized after doing this, that this is a you know, common feature in many experiments involving communication that you're confounding both communication and the fact that you're priming people and giving the opportunity to sit and think about their behavior. So we do this as, 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 as well as this additional treatment. We find that the effects of discourse are still beyond the effects of this private reflection in Switzerland, but not in China. So in China, the private reflection seems to account for um, uh, at least a large part of the um, uh, effect of, the, of, of, of uh, discourse. But in Switzerland, there's still this additional effect of simply having people engage in discussion. And then lastly, again, I won't show you this in the interest of time. I can go back and, and show any of this during Q&A, but we also find this effect on the social norms regarding what's appropriate market behavior in this context measured using the Krupka-Weber method at the end of the experiment in a manner that's consistent with the treatment effects that we see on behavior. Okay, so that's basically what we did in, in the first experiment. And we were a bit surprised by the fact that we find these you know, fairly strong um, positive effects that even persist when we kind of thought that we were introducing features um, like removing the veil of ignorance and kicking out the third parties that would you know, really lower it and perhaps leave you in a situation that even has lower social responsibility in the baseline. So we did an experiment too, which was only conducted in Zurich, not in, not in, not in um, uh, Shanghai. We introduced two features that we thought were, okay, these are features that are present in the real world that are potentially gonna further lower the degree to which we observe um, social responsibility and perhaps eliminate the, the positive impacts of discourse. The first is that in our first experiment, the impact was on these third parties that were other subjects. They were just like you. They come to the same experiment. They had the bad luck of drawing a card. They were sitting in the room. Fairness concerns were very, very salient. Whereas in, in most real world situations, people are thinking about internalizing these external impacts or thinking about people far away. Um, the impacts are much more distant, much more uncertain. And so we replaced the third party with a charity. And the charity was basically one that pays farmers in low-income countries to plant trees. So they argue that they're both alleviating inequality and reducing um, uh, um, uh, or helping combat climate change through kind of um, a carbon offset type of type of um, uh, impact. Um, so the, the, we replicated our exclusive condition because the charity wasn't present and wasn't, you know, didn't engage in the discourse. And so we basically have this baseline versus exclusive conditions where now the impact is on a charity. The other thing that we realized, or someone mentioned during a, a, an earlier presentation of, of the first experiment was that in many real world situations, these impacts um, the, the discourse only arises after people engage in some behavior, after we're used to driving carbon emitting cars or after we're used to kind of using animal products for a variety of uses. And so the question is, once people have experience with this behavior, is it harder to change their, 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 their conduct via this type of market, uh, this public discourse? So in the second treatment, what we did is we basically um, uh, just had eight periods of the baseline and then we introduced the discourse to see if, it ha if, if that mitigates its effect. Um, when people have perhaps more justifications for continuing to do what they've done before. So what we find is that again, both discourse conditions produce substantial increases in the market share of the responsible product. Um, sorry, my timer just went off. Um, so here I'm showing you again, just a snapshot, not the dynamics, um, just an interest of showing a simpler graph, but basically what we see is relative to the baseline, both the, the, the exclusive treatment where it's the, cons the consumer and the firm or the consumers and the sellers discussing um, what to do in the market when the impact is on a charity. And also when they have previous experience trading in the market, we see that um, there's a positive impact of discourse in both of these cases. Um, and then we also observe again, an effect on the social norms measured using this corrupt Weber method at the end. Um, so then just to conclude and hopefully leave time for a question or two, um, you know, I've, I've taken you through what we do in this paper. I think the most surprising thing to us is that we find that there's this very substantial, large positive impact of this discourse, even though people engage only one time at the beginning of the experiment. And as I said, relative to other literature on communication, its effects on pro-social behavior in, in laboratory settings, one thing that's interesting to us is that this is people reaching agreement to harm themselves, right? We're reaching an agreement to, to trade a product that costs more to produce that we're gonna to have to absorb that cost. And it only benefits either another participant who, who is not one of us or, or a charity outside the laboratory. And yet people seem to kind of um, uh, use these opportunities to communicate, to act in a substantially more pro-social manner um, in, in this market setting. But of course, there's a lot more that we need to do to really understand um, you know, how these things work or to the extent to which they really kind of can be effective um, for behavioral change, All right? Thanks. Great, Roberto. So uh, Nora, you have sort of three minutes before ACSA support uh, told us that they will cut us off. So uh, I hope they don't. So please uh, take your discussion away. 
<laughs> but if you take uh, away your slides, I can upload mine. Okay, sorry. Did I go yes. over time? I thought I was Thank under you. time. Um, so you were it's like a minute here, a minute there. Okay, let me, sorry. Yeah. Let me thank you so much for um, this presentation, dear Roberto, and I also enjoyed the paper a lot. Um, so, so I think uh, one question is, of course, why do we want to improve the morals in markets? And um, I did research on that myself, as you mentioned. Um, you don't refer to it in the paper, but I think it could help you because um, we see that individually, outside of the markets, um, the morals are much higher than when people act as market traders. And so it would be interesting to see, do I go back to these individual moral standards if I impose, uh, for example, public debate? as you do it. I think it would give you a nice uh, benchmark and a good reason mm -hmm. for why we would like to see these market outcomes morally improved. Um, then you show that uh, the discourse uh, helps even if the third party is not given a voice. And I found that uh, interesting and surprising. Uh, it would be great to understand better why this is the case. Initially, I would have thought uh, giving them a voice is, is very important. You also show that uh, if you impose a kind of more reflection individually, this is um, yeah almost as good uh, as the debate as well. So um, I thought it would be really interesting to understand better, is there specific arguments that are necessary here to convince people to be more moral? Or is it like, you know, in this Ten Commandments paper where people just um, give the Ten Commandments and then become more moral? And so is there something about arguments that matters? If you have a tentative word analysis in the paper,